Let's look at blood pressure in the heart. Now think about what you're doing when you take somebody's blood pressure. You're not measuring how much pressure is inside these chambers of the heart like the ventricles. You're measuring how much pressure is inside the wall of an artery. And of course, the left brachial artery is the one that's most commonly used. So when you take blood pressure, you get this pressure inside this artery. Think about why you would ever want to take blood pressure. You think about somebody's blood pressure being important because the heart has to overcome that pressure if it's going to move blood. Remember, blood is only going to move when there's a pressure gradient, meaning there are two areas of different pressures. So the higher it gets in your arteries, the higher it's got to be at the heart. Because if it's not higher at the heart, it's not going to be moving away from the heart and out to the body. So that's why blood pressure is important. The higher somebody's blood pressure gets, the harder the heart has to work. And of course, the harder that heart has to work, the quicker it uses up its ATP and oxygen. And if it ever runs into oxygen debt, that's when somebody has a heart attack right there. But you also hear about mean arterial pressure. Mean is just the average. And as you've probably heard before, the average blood pressure for your adult in the left brachial artery, definitely not all of them and not in the heart, but just in that artery, is around 120 over 80. There's your systolic and diastolic. So if you want to know the mean arterial pressure for just that one particular artery, just add your numbers together, divide by two, and there's your average right there. But when you talk about this arterial pressure, you always have to look at a couple of things. Cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Now the resistance to the blood flow happens out in all these pipes we call arteries and veins. That'll be covered in another video. But cardiac output, we'll look at here. Cardiac output is also sometimes called minute volume because it's how much blood your heart pumps in a minute. Well, if you want to know how much blood your heart pumps in a minute, you only need to know two things. How many times did it beat in a minute at your heart rate? And how much blood did it pump with each cardiac cycle? And that's stroke volume. So if you just take these two things and multiply them, that gives you your cardiac output or minute volume right there. So look at this cardiac output for a person that's resting versus exercising right here. When a person is at rest, somewhere around 72 beats per minute for an adult is what you'll find. And that heart's moving about 70 milliliters of blood with each contraction. Multiply the two gives you about five liters of blood. But look at the big change you see when someone's exercising. Look at that heart rate going from 72 to 190. That stroke volume going from 70 to 115. You got to remember that when you exercise, two things is happening with your heart. <clears throat> Not only is it beating faster, but it's also contracting with more force. That allows it to move more blood with each contraction, get more contractions, and of course you get a big increase in cardiac output, and that can go up, say, somewhere around 22 liters. And when you take these numbers and look at the difference between them, that's your cardiac reserve. That's how much extra additional blood that your heart can pump whenever you're exercising. And that is truly your capacity to do work. One thing you got to unlearn is it's not as much the condition of these skeletal muscles and how big and strong they are. Your capacity to do work is much, much more dependent on how much blood your heart can pump. So the bigger this reserve, how much extra blood you can pump when exercising, the better off you're going to be. And your heart rate can get up higher than 190, but you don't want it to get above 190. When it does, you get very inefficient with all that cardiac muscle. Because think about it, 190. That's more than three beats a second right there. The problem with your heart rate going above 190 is that that is so fast, there's not enough time for the chambers to fill. And if the chambers can't fill, this stroke volume is going to drop. So you really don't want to ever see your heart rate above 190. That should be somewhere about where your maximum cardiac output will be found. Because you go above 190 with this number, this one's going to go down, and this number's going to go down. It means you're going to be pumping less blood, and obviously you don't want that. But let's look at some factors inside the heart that have something to do with this heart function. And right here we're going to look at two intrinsic factors. Now, looking at these intrinsic factors, the first one is preload. Preload is the amount to which the ventricle walls are being stretched. Well, think about what's going to cause them to be stretched. The filling with more blood. 
So preload tells you that as you stretch the walls of the ventricles more, in other words, you fill them with more blood, your stroke volume goes up. <clears throat> it makes sense that if they fill with more blood, they could move more with each contraction. And Starling's Law just tells us that as preload goes up, stroke volume goes up. Just opposite would apply too. So there's nothing much to Starling's Law. And if you really want to increase this preload, in other words, fill your ventricles more with each cardiac cycle, best way you can do it is to contract skeletal muscle. A lot of people don't realize when they contract skeletal muscle, one thing those muscles are doing is squeezing blood back towards the heart. When you contract those muscles, you squeeze some of the blood out of them. Well, the blood in the veins is going back towards the heart. So those skeletal muscles are pumping that blood in those veins back towards your heart. And the more you push it back, the more you can fill those ventricles. That is a great way to increase your preload. Contraction of the smooth muscle in the wall of the blood vessels is another way. Now, another intrinsic factor here is afterload. This is the backflow pressure that that left ventricle has to overcome behind that aortic semilunar valve. Now, remember, that left ventricle pushes blood through that aorta. It's the very first of your arteries and pushes that blood through that aorta from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. So that's a lot of backflow pressure on that aortic semilunar valve. But that left ventricle is so strong, it can overcome that backflow pressure quite easily. So that is why afterload has a minor effect on stroke volume, but preload has a very big effect on your stroke volume. Let's also look at some factors outside of the heart, which definitely have, a, have some control over this cardiac function. You're probably already familiar with the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the nervous system. These have probably been discussed before. Now remember that parasympathetic divisions, what's also called your rest and relaxation response. This division, these neurons are active when you're sitting, resting, eating, sleeping, something such as that. So it makes sense that they would decrease your heart rate. <clears throat> and they might be able to decrease it by about 20 to 30, just depends on what's happening with the individual. All this is supplied by the vagus nerve. Remember, that's one of the cranial nerves you've probably seen before. When acetylcholine, is released by these neurons onto these cardiac muscle cells, it will hyperpolarize the cell membrane. Now, hyper, remember, means more, greater, something such as that. What it's doing is letting potassium out of those cells. Think about what you're doing if you let potassium out of a cardiac cell. You're putting more positive on the outside of the cell. Well, that's going to make the outside charge more positive. Now, the difference between that outside positive and inside negative is bigger in difference than what it was before. And if this makes the resting membrane potential greater in difference, then you have to move more positive on in to swap the charges than what you did previously. And if you have to move more on, that's going to take more time. And the longer it takes to swap those charges, the slower your heart's going to beat right there. But look at the sympathetic division. Everybody knows this is also called the fight or flight division. This can increase the heart rate up as high as 250 to 300. But again, that would be under extreme circumstances, usually when the brain, and specifically the brain stem, is not getting enough blood flow. 190 is as high as you want to see it there. This is supplied by cardiac nerves. We've looked at the SA and AV nodes in previous discussions and other videos. But this sympathetic division, doesn't matter where you find these neurons at, will always release epinephrine and norepinephrine. These chemical signals here are going to let calcium enter the cell. Look at what you're doing now, right? Previously, we let a positive ion out. This is going to let a positive ion in. So you're moving some of that positive from the outside to the inside. So now your outside is less positive than what it was before just the opposite of what we had above. And now that the charges on that membrane potential are less different, you can swap them faster. And that's how it makes your heart beat quicker. That is hypopolarizing the heart right there. So you've probably seen these two divisions of the nervous system before, but again, that parasympathetic with that acetylcholine lets potassium out of the cell, makes the outside more positive, makes the charges greater in difference. Here, with the sympathetic and the epinephrine and norepinephrine, you let the calcium in. Now you've moved a positive in instead of out. 
makes the charges less different. That's hypopolarizing. Now you can swap them faster. That's what makes the heart beat quicker at that time. So there's a good little discussion on some of those other factors affecting the heart. And there's just some pictures, as always, that you can look at that go over some of this material.